Let's go here. Check this one now. She's, she's lurking behind the tree. Oh, stepping out from her hiding place. They do look pretty hungry, I must say. Look how beautifully she hides behind there, how she just disappears behind the colour of that fallen terminalia tree. Species of lions earlier, and the Kalahari lion, what was referred to as the Transvaal lion, and the Kalahari lion, I suppose, might be considered by some to be a subspecies. And then you want to know about the Barnaby lion. I'm afraid I've never heard of a Barnaby lion, unless it's maybe the Barbary lion you're talking about. The Barbary lion, of course, comes from the Barbary area of the Atlas Mountains in northern Africa, and I think in very much the same way might be considered by some to be a separate subspecies, by, but by many, it would be considered a, the same species. Now they do, as you say, I'm just going to move around so we can get a better view here. As you say, um, they do have amazingly thick manes that go right down, sort of halfway down the back and down the chest, a bit like mine. My mane goes all the way down the chest. Now, David, yours doesn't, so you're not a Barbary lion. I am a Barbary human being. And... Just lurking next to the termite mound, you can only see one lion. But if you look very carefully, you can see one lion's tail sticking out the back. So there you can see a wildebeest in the background. Can you see the wildebeest? It just stay right where you were, Dave. She's, he's just walking through the, the woodland to the back. There it is, to the left-hand side of your screen about to disappear, and that's what they're looking at, of course, but the wildebeest know what's going on here. They're very wily creatures. And you can see in the flat light, and by flat light, I just mean the fact that there is no contrast because the sun is not out yet. Everything kind of does meld into the background. Yeah, wildebeest and zebra, huge herd. Now, that wildebeest herd has done so well to escape the attentions of the lions. They've managed to raise all ten of their little babies to the year, to the month that they have now. They're almost three months old now, well, three and a half to four, some of them. And that means that they will be very adept at getting away from things that want to eat them. Hello, Anna. You want to know where tree climbing lions are found? Tree climbing lions, again, the same species as this. Look at them stalking away here. I think they're wasting their time, but we'll carry on watching. Well, the other one's got up and is now moving as well today. Also going behind a scraggly apple leaf tree. Anna, a tree climbing lion is the same lion as this, and they're found often in the Lake Manyara National Park of Tanzania. And it is thought that they climb the lions in order to get away from the biting flies that they have there. And so these lions, as many of you will know, do climb trees sometimes. But it is highly unusual for them to do it here. In that Lake Manyara National Park, you'll find enormous trees. I think they're actually torchwood trees with uh, lions draped about in the boughs. I'm going to give them a bit of space and we get too close just so that we can make sure we don't disturb them on this, um, what I think is a, uh, well, a, a foolhardy dawn raid. Hmm, nice 
question from Monkey Man here as we watch them sort of on the hunt. Monkey Man, you want to know how close they have to be in order to catch a wildebeest or a zebra. Monkey Man within 20 meters. Now, the lions are over here to us. They're about 20 meters from us. And then that's, well, that's two of them. And then to the left, there's another one just where I'm pointing now, underneath that fallen tree. To the right of that fallen tree, David. There's another fallen tree with a lion under it. There they are. And the wildebeest, I'm afraid, are at least 150 meters to in the direction that she's looking. So just over there, under that big green sort of thicket to the left of that. And they seem to have moved off now. You can actually see them moving there. If you go left a bit, Dave, you might see them straight over the bonnet. There we go. So she's got to close down at least another 130 meters. It's an interesting one, Judy. I was just wondering this myself. You want to know, Judy, if these lions are capable of some sort of forethought? Did they plan their hunt? Um, Judy, I don't know. I think it's entirely instinctual, you know. I think that they do communicate on a level, though, that we don't understand, to be honest. I think that they... When you see them move off on the hunt, it's almost like there's been an invisible signal given, but there's no obvious sound like there is with uh, elephant herds when they move. There's no obvious communication. I think that they do communicate, though. I just don't think we understand exactly how they do it. You also want to know, are they capable of malice and forethought? Um, Judy, I would say that very few animals out here are capable of malice. Are some nastier than others? Yes, to a certain extent, possibly they are. Uh, are they able to plan something evil and then execute it? No, I don't believe that they are. I think they're largely acting purely on instinct. Remember, they don't have a moral code, if you like, that they worry about. They just do what they feel like doing. And I think the closer you get to us, does it? Does a chimpanzee, for example, have a moral code? No, it doesn't. But is a chimpanzee capable of um, deceit and capable of forethought? Possibly much more so than a lion can, and we, in turn, much more so than that. I think that's a really interesting topic to discuss. Thanks, Judy. There's the other third one's come up here. And I don't know if you can still hear, but those... Ground hornbills just keep going. Now, Keith, you want to know basically who's leading this charge. Is there a leader, or do they vary who takes down what? Look, there's a wildebeest coming up here, Dave. I think they can smell the lions, I can see them, and there's a big bull now come to have a look. Lioness approaching him is about, oof, Dave, what would you say, about 100 meters? Maybe 300 feet? Just over? But she's definitely been seen. Um, oh, that's a wonderful picture. Look at that wonderful light. So, Keith, I don't believe that um, there's a necessarily a leader. I think possibly if we watch the Nguhuma Pride hunt every single time they hunt, we might find that there's a certain order of things that is maintained. There she comes. They're all alarming at her. But yes, um, they will all take an animal down. Of course, they don't know where an animal's going to run, and often they will ambush it. The animal will run in a different direction towards the lioness that isn't actually hunting, or that isn't actually in the stalk, and she'll then take it down. All right, we're going to move here, just to give you a better view of what's going on. to the left now. Look, there they're running. The wildebeest are running. That's beautiful. Isn't that stunning? Here she goes. She's going to have a go. She's having a go. The others are not helping. Hold on. There she goes. 
she goes. I can see her running there, Dave, just to the left. She's blasting through here. Hold on, Dave. She's running flat out. Oh, she's going fast. Look at her moving. Look at her moving. This is unbelievable. Look at her go. She's still going. That was just unbelievable. Oh my goodness. How she didn't catch one of these little things, I don't know. That's so unusual. You don't see that. She was running like a cheetah after them. And the others just sat and watched in bemused astonishment as she totally discredited all the books on how a lioness is supposed to hunt. She approached them straight across the open. Well done, you clever girl. Well, not so clever, but you certainly gave us a hell of a thrill. I'm just going to try and see which one she is. Now, she's the slightly... She's the kind of... Not the oldest... She's probably the second oldest in the pride. She and Amber Eyes, I think, are very similar age. Oh, that was just fantastic. <laughs> and Brent, I've got her here. She's stopped at the side of the clearing. Confirm the others are still sitting watching in bemused silence. Brent is also around everyone. There's one next to Jamie where they were just watching. I didn't see one of the others also run. Apparently Brent says, I'm just going to let you hear him. He says he did see some of the others running, or one of the others running, but I don't think anything's happened. Let's just stay with our cheetah slash lioness here. I've never seen that before, everyone. I've never seen a lioness run like that. Listen, they're calling now. Listen, here she comes, Dave. There she is. She's calling. Jerry, you're in Illinois and you want to know what the success rate is of a lion on a hunt. Not very impressive. I think you'll probably find it's not more than 20 or 30 percent. So three out of ten, two to three times out of ten, they will catch. If they adopted the approach that this lioness approaches, I think you'd find it would be much less than that. See, she's calling. You can maybe just hear her going, ooh, ooh. This is just too special. Yeah, it's wonderful. I just can't believe the colours we're getting this morning, everyone. I, I, even in this incredibly thick cloud, the colours of green and tawny and the tree stumps and this beautiful flush of verdant green that we have on the clearings, I just think is so wonderful. Look at her line there. Yes, Kevin, I feel exactly the same way. You say you're out of breath from just watching her. Me too. That was incredible. And, you, of course, we don't normally get that across a clearing where we can follow them at high speed and not disturb it. I mean, we were probably about 50 meters to the side of her. Here we go, Dave. Here comes the other one coming in to say hello. Just over there. Now, this is the one referred to as the slightly sort of narrow-eyed female. And she's also not a youngster. 
You can see her nose is completely black. She's also got extremely swollen nipples. That's interesting. That's very interesting, everyone. She's certainly not fat at all, and they're not suckle marks, but she's got very swollen teats. That's fascinating. This is wonderful. They're all four coming down here now. Here come the others. So as I was saying, in a clearing like this, you can stay with them. You can drive next to them and it was, I don't know what your picture looked like. I wasn't looking at the picture at all. Oh, this is wonderful. Very good question there. What happened to teamwork? Well, I think a few things actually, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, I think they're uh, generally very lazy. It is, of course, daytime, which means that they are, or they realize that everything can see them coming now. And I think you'll find that most of them were totally astonished that their colleague chose to approach those wildebeest straight out in the open but what she did do was she panicked them and those little ones although well i mean you should, they're, they're too big they're, they're quick now two months ago she would have had a very good chance of actually catching one because they would have got tired and they would have probably been unable to keep up that speed for the amount of time that they did how far did they run they probably ran about 400 meters a quarter mile it probably ran a quarter mile at that speed which is that's for a cat like this who's supposed to stalk to within sort of 20 meters of their prey that's quite far that's a good run for one of these and i mean we were really moving we were probably doing poof, at one stage we were probably doing about i don't know about 30 miles an hour and Christopher, you're in Arizona, you want to know if this is it, that's it, will they stop hunting now, will they try and follow that herd? They won't follow that herd, Christopher, I don't think so. I think that herd is probably somewhere near southern Zimbabwe at this stage. Um, so I don't think they're going to follow the herd, Christopher. I think that they will, they might, if, if something comes past here, they think about hunting it. But I mean, they're all four laid out here in the wide open space of the clearing. And that is not exactly typical hunting behavior. I think you'll find that they were hunting last night and probably failed quite dismally to catch anything. And so that's why they just kind of, they'll try anything that they can in the morning before they go to sleep for the rest of the day. We're going around the corner side there, Dave. the side just get a better view of them on that termite mound there <laughs> Diane you say she's not breathing heavily after that impressive sprint I agree I think lions look like they're not running as fast as they are though I think they also look like they're not putting in as much effort as they might and certainly whenever I've seen a lion hunting and, and running it always looks to me like they're just kind of loping along, but they are going, they've got such an incredible stride length. So the speed is much higher than you think it is, A. And B, they, I think they, they just look like they're not putting in that much effort, but I think you'll find that they are putting in an immense amount of effort to run at that sort of speed. They don't have that kind of, that, um, what we think of is that if you think of a dog taking off running, it's got that incredibly fast initial bounding motion where the legs seem to all blur into one. These guys just immediately launch into this incredibly long, um, uh, long bounding stride. And it looks like they're not going for it, but they're actually going as fast as they can. Here they are on the flat termite mound, not a termite. Mm -hmm. 
whose sighting was that, David? Um, it must have been the one outside camp. Ah, yes. x ranger you say this is a very good uh, practice for Dave, uh, given the fact that the other day he claimed to have seen a lion chasing something in the middle of the day or just after breakfast. And Brent then went to have a look and couldn't find any tracks. And you say this will help him to identify lions in the future. x ranger I think Brent's been very nasty to David, to be honest. I think I'm pretty sure he did see a lion. And they're quite difficult to mistake. Brent thinks that he saw a kudu <laughs> chasing an impala, which I think is a little unfair. See, I've disappeared, everyone. Don't worry, David, I believe you. Thanks, James. Sandblaster for your comment. You say prime condition these lions are in, and I would agree with you completely. Uh, primed for anything, you say. Um, I'm not sure how primed for anything they are. I think they're primed to snooze. They're hopefully going to have a nice playtime now. There's no heat coming out of the sun yet, so with any luck, they'll do some playing. But the hunting, I think, is going to be pretty much over. But they are in good condition, Sandblaster, I agree. I think that they are in very fine condition. And, of course, a thin lion is totally normal. They do get skinny if they don't eat, obviously. are nearly as swollen as the other one. It's so amazing to watch them like this, kind of being friendly to each other and having a playtime and enjoying each other's company, while if you watch them at a kill together, they will absolutely smash each other to pieces. Let's go up the road here. Hope that they don't go into some thick bush. We're just going to turn on the VR rig, everyone. Sorry, Louise, you're going to have to go again with that. Natasha, there's a question from you. I'm coming through. Now, you want to know what animal the lions are most successful at catching out here. This pride is pretty adept at, uh, they're quite variable. They catch quite a few buffalo, uh, young buffalo these days, latterly, because they've lost the help of the young male who used to live with them, that's Junior, very, a great favorite amongst our loyal viewers. I'm just going to turn the VR on now. The VR, everybody, is this uh, ball of GoPro cameras that you can see in the left-hand side of your screen. And that'll give us a 360 view of everything, so like a cylindrical, um, spherical view of the world. So if I start talking that way, that's why I'm talking that way. Um, so, Natasha, this pride, yeah, pretty good with buffalo. Never seen them catch a, a, a giraffe. Look over here. Watch to the left there. About to scratch. I thought she was going to scratch. It's a pity. And then off to the front, of course, the front and left, the other two lions walking around the road. Sorry, my head in the way. Santa Anna, since the females do most of the hunting, are they able to run faster than the males? I've read that they can. I don't believe it myself. Um, they certainly look a bit more lithe and flexible, for example, than a male lion does. But a male lion is a powerful, powerful beast, and I think that they are extremely quick off the mark. And certainly they're not, um, I'm just trying to think of the human equivalent. 
if you look at a sprinter like Usain Bolt, for example, if you look at his build, he's muscly, he's big, he's not, um, he's not a skinny marathon runner type like a wild dog, for example. Um, and I think the same principle applies to a male lion. I think you'll find that a, although a male lion is, is a big and <laughs> look at them fighting there or playing, although a male lion is a very large animal and built for fighting, they are incredibly fast as well. So if we do, if we're a little slow getting to the lions on the camera, everyone, it's because Dave is operating, of course, a ball of GoPros at the same time. Right, let's get next to that. Now what this VR rig, for those of you who don't know, will do is it will allow a spherical view. So if you are eventually see this footage, you'll be able to see me talking to you. And just over to the left, of course, you'll see the lions walking in the front. One now pouncing into the bushes there, coming towards us, straight towards the front of the car. <laughs> Is that cool? I don't know how on earth she got through that huge thicket. You'll be able to see the grey sky above. Ah, yes. Now, Ravi, sorry, I was completely distracted by, for your question. You wanted to know about the relationship between the local people here who live outside the park and the lions. So one up there on the front of the road, one two off to the left now. Ravi, you'll find that the fencing here is effective enough to keep the lions out of the villages. So while certainly sometimes lions get out under the fence, sometimes they kill cattle, the... I can hear another one calling. Way in the distance. Ravi, basically, um, it's uh, the chances of a human-lion conflict where a lion would harm a human being out here are almost negligible. So lions do sometimes get out of the reserve, and then they will normally kill cattle and then come back into the reserve. So there, that is not usual. It's quite unusual. The further north you go, the more usual it becomes because the fence isn't in such a good condition. But out here, that's it's really uncommon. Now, the difficulty then, of course, is what happens to that lion when they get out. This one is either coughing or has eaten something distasteful. No, eaten something horrible, going to have a bomb. Hmm. Anyway, Ravi, um, if a lion does get out, and if a whole pride gets out and they become a menace, obviously it then becomes very difficult to contain them. So sometimes they have to be relocated. But for example, if one of these lionesses got out of the fence, killed the cow, and then came back into the reserve, um, there's a whole arrangement for compensation. The local people, if they lose cattle to lions like that, and then the lioness would just be left alone. But if they made a habit of it, then they would have to be Fighting there, not fighting, playing. Looks like they're fighting sometimes. We'll just get around in front of them there so we can stop the car and you won't get seasick while you watch these magnificent lions. It's so nice to see them doing something other than lying about, doing absolutely nothing, which is their general default position, which is not a criticism of theirs, it's just how they're built. We go through the trees here and just get into a position where we can see them over there to the left hand side.
she's now hiding from her she's hiding from her friend or her sister look here they go this is awesome did you hear that did you hear the sound of them running that just gives you an indication of how big they are of their incredible weight and size now i don't know where the fourth one is the fourth one has been kind of left behind can you see it Dave? Oh, there she is. She's lying just to the front and left of the car. Brilliant. Okay, let's follow the three who are at They're all now to the right. If you look to the right, you can see them there. Now digging. question from Matthew. Oh, look at them go. Sorry, we will try and get into a position where we can see them, but they're stalking each other here on the left-hand side. Matthew, um, you want to know if I think that this green vegetation is disadvantaging them because it's not obviously as typically coloured as they are. So if you watch the ones in front of us where they're walking through that long, what we call yellow thatching grass, you can see how the tawny colour is much better suited to that dry grass. Um, Matthew, no, I don't think it does. I'll tell you why I don't think it does. Because they are designed, of course, to be camouflaged when the vegetation is the, at its most sparse. Now, in winter time, when it's brown and, and tawny, the same colour as they are, then the vegetation is very sparse. There are no leaves on the trees and the grass is very short, and so it's easy for them to hide. Uh, but in summertime, when the leaves are like this, so if you watch this line is coming off to the, from the left-hand side here, you can see her coming through the green trees. Yes, the color isn't quite as well camouflaged as it is in the tawny winter vegetation, but there's so much more vegetation, so many more leaves, and the grass is so much thicker that they're able to hide much more effectively than they would be in winter. So I hope that makes sense. I don't think it does disadvantage them. They use camouflage less in the summertime and cover more in the summer. And in the winter, they will rely far more on the camouflage because there isn't quite so much cover. And I think the same principle would apply to a leopard. That's a beautiful picture. Gee, that's a lovely shot. Just see her throat moving there. Wonderful. Mm. Now, Star, you want to know about whether that or not they use to know whether or not they use their tails in the same way that a leopard does to basically tell alarm calling animals that they mean no harm by flicking that white tail tip up no star i've never seen them do the same thing that's an interesting question but no i've never seen them do that so they're off to the front dead straight front we've got lioness she's looking they're stalking something here goes to the left, another one, and behind us, obviously, there's been some communication. And it's the other lioness coming through here. Back far left, she's coming through this thicket of scraggly trees. I thought they were stalking something, but they just saw each other, reacquainted themselves. Now watch, let's see what happens. Watch the one on the ground and see if she jumps up. Yeah, look at her, just like a house cat, preparing the hind legs. Getting perches with the claws in the ground. Look, look. Isn't that brilliant? 
ears flattened against the... <laughs> that is fantastic. Slight irritation there on the face of the older female. I think that is a slightly younger one there. And there's some Impala alarm calling off to the far, sort of right in front of the vehicle. So I think they've smelt or seen these lionesses. So just the three of them at the moment. The fourth one, I think, is just further forward. Brilliant stuff. heavy they are. The mass is quite astonishing. They're way out in front is the fourth one. So we've got two on the right, one on the left, one out in front. And we're heading straight for the one in front. sure that my radio is turned up because something else happened that you want to obviously know about it. But I think for the meantime we'll stay with these wonderful lions. Watch them now. Watch them left, and two right, one in front. You see them stalking each other. One on the right now about to stalk the one on the left. There they go. <laughs> A combined attack. There you can see the size difference of the one in the middle. Um, Clayton, you want to know if these lions had never seen a Land Rover before, would they be so relaxed? Would they be so confiding? No, they would not. They would run. Lions that you see for the first time, I've seen a few times, they will run away. But it doesn't take long. Because they're so confident, because they know that so little out here is a threat to them, it takes very little time for them to habituate, become used to vehicles, and then just relax completely around you. It's a very good question, of course, as to how on earth we can possibly be so close to Africa's apex predator. Well, second to us, of course. because the color is so different. That's a really great comment. <laughs> so it obviously looks so different from when, from what it did, say, uh, 10 days ago, a week ago even. And it's so green now. You say it's so green that it made you think we had a different camera. I think that's an amazing observation. And I was thinking, I mean, I obviously know, knew, know we didn't have new cameras. But I was watching this morning uh, on the screen, on this monitor here that is in the vehicle, and I was thinking, but the color is just so magnificent. I haven't seen this for so long. It's exactly what it is. It's that everything's gone green. Now, they are stalking slowly through here. And I mean, they haven't seen anything to stalk. Oh, look, here we go. Put her there, scratching her claws, just like a house cat would. Look at that. Look at the claws. So I say they're stalking through here just simply because they have spread out. So they've spread out into that kind of hunting formation. They haven't spotted anything, so it's not like they're about to leap off again. And let me assure you, if we go through this area here, we won't be going at anything like the speed that we were earlier on. Here's this youngster. This is a youngster here, the very skinny one, who keeps running up and having a play. some cheetah so they're all on the right hand side now one behind and then the three in front here um jeff 
if you want to know if they use their tails as a counterbalance while, ru while running like a cheetah does. So for those of you who don't know, a cheetah basically has an extremely heavy tail, which is used as almost like a rudder. It's not like a rudder, it's like a counterbalance, as Jeffrey says, where they will fling it from side to side in order to help them change direction quickly when they're chasing antelope or gazelles across the plains. Um, but Jeffrey, no, I don't think lions would because they're not normally running at those sorts of speeds for that length of time. So I think that you'll find that the tail proportionately is far smaller than that on a cheetah and therefore would be pretty useless as a counterbalance. This is just wonderful having them stalking through here. tracks here. Now I said that they wouldn't follow the wildebeest herd. I expect, expect that maybe they are stalking them through here, hoping that they will get caught in the thickets here. That's interesting. Um, Ravi, you want to know about whether or not I feel you think that there's a, a skewed ratio of prey to predators, and is this some kind of evolutionary adaptation? Um, Ravi, it's, it is, and it's well known. It's completely normal. Basically, in any ecosystem, you will find that the ratio of prey to predators heavily favors the prey. And that's simply because, I mean, the higher up the food chain you are, the fewer of you there are going to be. And as soon as it's a delicate, what we call a dynamic equilibrium, on a very simple level, um, what you'll have, and you'll see this in a, say, I mean, if you look at foxes and hares, for example, lions and wildebeest or lions and their prey items, as the populations of prey go up, so the predator populations will start to meet them. And then once the predator populations reach a certain level, the prey populations will then start to decline. And as they start to decline, so the predator populations will follow them into decline. So it is this kind of dynamic equilibrium where the prey and predator numbers are constantly kind of dancing around each other. But always you will find that there are fewer predators than there are prey in any given ecosystem. That's just the way it works. Nice question from you, um, Dr. Debbie. You want to know how much does it throw off the hunt if one of the pride members is missing, like uh, the one of these lionesses is. She's a well, she's a busy solidifying, shall we say, her bond with the, with the Birmingham boys. Look up here. Look up on the termite mound there. How cool is that? Oh, that's just wonderful. Debbie, um, I don't think hugely. Remember that often with these lionesses, three is kind of um, three and above. There doesn't seem to be a huge amount of advantage to having any more in the pride as far as hunting goes. So while there are four of them here, uh, one of them is a sub-adult, so maybe <laughs> that, is, that is quintessential sphinx-like lion behavior, isn't it? Let me just move this. Some shot here. You might get an epic screenshot of this. We're going to get quite close here, everybody. So just hold your breath. Don't make any loud noises. This is fantastic. 
Gary, you want to know why she wants to sit on that termite mound? Gary, simply because it gives her a vantage point. She can see what's going on around her. A termite mound is probably 10 feet high, more maybe, and so she's 10 feet above. Remember that the vegetation here is quite thick, but there's not much topography, so even 10 feet up will give you an amazing vantage. Look at this. Isn't that wonderful? I'm just going to quickly talk to Jamie. Go ahead. A affirmative, slowly in a westerly direction. I'm just going to call them in now. Ephraim, we've just located in Kuhuma Pride, uh, mobile west through the block from Zoe's Road. Uh, they will probably pop out at some stage on Impala Plains. This is incredible stuff. Ooh, marvelous. I hope you got some screenshots there, everybody. So often you have a lion sitting above you. It's normally us looking down on them. Mercedes, we were looking there, the lioness um, sharpening her claws, and you want to know if they keep growing like the human nail does. Yes, they do. Just like your house cats, just like a dog's, they will keep growing. Whole life. But of course, they use them quite a lot more than a house cat uses its claws. Thank you for all the screenshots you've sent through. So I think they're probably getting to the stage where they're going to think about going to sleep for the rest of the day. They seem to have run out of steam after the excesses of the morning. They have given us a wonderful run around. Hello, Michelle. Um, you want to know how far we've moved along from where we started? Well, quarantine clearings as the crow flies is mm, sort of basically exactly where that line's looking about three or four, no, maybe 500 meters, half a kilometer. So just over, just over a quarter mile. So not far. Maybe a little bit more than that. Quarter to a third of a mile, 600 meters. It always seems like they move further than they do, but it's not often that very far. I, mean, I think we'll sit here another five minutes and see if they do get up and do anything, but I suspect quite strongly that the entertainment is up. We will need to decide what else we can do this, after, this morning on this little piece of paradise that we're very privileged to call home. Look at the colour, it's just too wonderful. <laughs> 